I find that wherever I go, all over the world, and we've been now to 64 countries for crusades, all the countries of Eastern Europe except Bulgaria, and we'll soon probably be going there, and we're going to China this year, God willing, and wherever we go, we find that there's a fear in the world. People are afraid. They're afraid that there's going to be a world economic depression. They're afraid of an atomic war. They're afraid that we won't even see the end of this century just 12 years from now. Many people in this country are. And I find that students are that way. And the greatest killer now among university students is suicide. It's doubled in two years of those under 19 years of age. And so the whole country and the whole world, and after various terrorist attacks, watching television interviews, the question being asked is this, what can we do to eliminate terrorism and violence? And the answer always comes back, I wish I knew. But in the midst of all this fear and all this pessimism that I hear all over the world, I'm an optimist. Why am I an optimist? I'm an optimist in that I believe in a sovereign God who has other plans for the human race. My confidence and hope is not centered in the circumstances of life or the condition of the world, but in a living God who's going to accomplish His will and who is the sovereign of the whole universe. No, we're not going to have Armageddon until God's time comes. And there's plenty of time for us to straighten things out to an extent that it could be put off. My hope is not built on political systems or schemes or on human solutions to our problems. It's based on God. And in addition, as a Christian, I know that if I died right now, I would go into the presence of God to live forever in eternity with Him. So I'm an optimist, because, and I'm an optimist for another reason, because I believe it's still possible for us to grapple with many of our problems and begin to solve them. As long as there are men and women who have the dedication and the vision to provide spiritual and moral leadership for our generation, what kind of people will it take to solve the problems of our world? What kind of leaders should we have in the legislature, in various phases of government, in various phases of city and state life? The first quality I would like to mention out of four is integrity. It means a man or a woman is the same on the inside as they claim to be on the outside. There's no discrepancy between what he says and what he does, between his talk and his walk. A man or woman of integrity can be trusted, and he's the same person alone in a hotel room a thousand miles from Atlanta as he is here in his church or community. Solomon wrote long ago, the man of integrity walks securely, but he who takes crooked paths will be found out. One of the greatest gifts that a man can have is the ability to lie down at night and to know who he is and what he has done that day has been acted with integrity. The second quality that I believe is necessary for leadership at this hour is personal security. I do not mean in the sense of physical security or job security, but I'm instead talking about personal, emotional security the kind which comes from knowing and accepting who we are, why we're here, and where we're going. I do not believe that kind of security is found in our careers alone. We're not set up to provide emotional satisfaction. If the organization changes, or the government changes, or your job changes, the emotional satisfaction you get from your work may decrease sharply, and you're left with no other source of support. And then when retirement comes, you have little else to turn to. And that's the reason a man needs God. He needs Christ in his life to be the Lord that he can hold on to in those insecure moments. And that's the reason one of the men at the Miniature Institute in Kansas has said we need to diversify our emotional portfolio. And part of that diversification should include a proper emphasis on the spiritual aspect of life. You're not just a body or a mind, but you're a soul made in the image of God. And that spirit of yours, that soul of yours, needs fellowship with God. And that's why Jesus Christ came. Because you see from the Garden of Eden, man has been separated from God. 
and all of us have broken God's law and to sum it up in a three letter word it's called sin and we're all sinners we need to be reconciled to God and that's why when we come to Good Friday we celebrate the day that our Lord hung on the cross to bring reconciliation between you and God and to bring that emotional security and that peace and that joy that you can have in this world and the assurance of life hereafter. Yes, personal security includes a sense of inner peace, peace with God and peace with oneself. Jesus said, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, do not let it be afraid. And then the third quality that I would like to leave with you is a sense of priority. That's the ability to separate the important from the unimportant, the critical from the trivial, vital from the insignificant, the eternal from the temporary. It's essential that our daily task, but it's also true for the overall direction of our lives. Until a man gets his priorities in life straight, everything else is going to be out of order. As leaders, some of you are adept at planning, but many of you don't give much attention to your own life plan and the direction you're going and why, especially with our families and with our personal inward relationship to God. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Our first priority in life is to know God because we were made in the image of God with eternity in our hearts, the Bible says. And once that priority has been established, then the rest of life can be seen and lived in proper perspective. Without a proper attitude toward God, everything else in life will eventually take on more importance than it should have. And then the last quality of leadership that I would like to mention very briefly is the quality of vision. The Bible says without a vision the people perish. And this is the quality of seeing what can be done and what ought to be done and how to get there. Martin Luther King was a man of vision. I remember traveling with him to South America. We spent about a week together. And I remember the talks we had. And I remember in 1957 when we were holding our crusade in New York, a year before that in 56, I asked him to come to New York and brief our team and talk to us about what we could do to help in the racial problem not only in the South but in the North and he made an interesting statement. He said that the problem in the South is going to be solved before the problem in the North and I thought that was an interesting observation because it's my observation in traveling around the country that that's just about the way it is. But I remember when he got his Nobel Peace Prize someone asked him where did he get the motivation to become the great reformer and the great leader that he was. And he said, from the evangelical preaching of my father. In other words, he got it from the gospel, from the Bible. And we forget a great deal of that. I challenge you to be individuals who are committed to Jesus Christ. Because only in him can you know fully what it means to have integrity, personal security, priority, and vision as we yield ourselves to him and come to personal relationship with him and then walk day by day with him and follow his word then we discover the qualities of leadership we need and also the strength we need you know many people have asked me they said billy we've heard so many sermons and all but we don't hear very many people telling us how we can know christ well i'm going to tell you so you'll never have to stand before god and say i never heard the Bible teaches that we need to repent of our sins. That means to change our way of thinking, to turn around, to ask God's forgiveness for the past. It means, secondly, coming to the cross and kneeling and saying, Oh God, I accept your Son, Jesus Christ, as my Lord and my Master and my Savior. It means determined to follow Him. We have many people that profess Christ, but what we need to do is to follow Him and serve him and be his disciples if we don't i want to tell you this there's a strong possibility that in your lifetime our children's lifetime we're going to see armageddon armageddon in your business in your government in your personal life 
in our world. Fifteen nations now have the atomic bomb. It could fall into the hands of some terrorist group that could start a chain reaction that could destroy our world. And the only thing that we have that's going to stop it is God. And God will only do it in answer to prayer. That's why this prayer breakfast is so important. I heard about a, the president of one of the great companies on the East Coast. He instructed his secretary not to disturb him because he had an important appointment. The chairman of the board came in and said, I want to see Mr. Jones. The secretary answered and said, I'm terribly sorry, sir, but he cannot be disturbed. He has a special appointment. The chairman became very irritated. He banged on the door. Then he opened the door and he saw the president of that great corporation on his knees in prayer. The chairman softly closed the door and asked the secretary, is this usual? And the secretary said, every morning, sir. The chairman said, no wonder our company is making such great progress and no wonder I come to him for advice. Let's be men and women of prayer and followers of Jesus Christ.